how much of a role does the department play in deciding uh, whether to move forward with the case, an enforcement case, and what type of um, action to bring, what remedies to seek. Um, I know the defense section doesn't focus on criminal enforcement, but I would imagine that they're at least involved in the discussions uh, with the criminal section about whether criminal enforcement is appropriate in a case like that. So, so how does, is it mostly the agencies deciding, or how does the department work with the agencies on those issues? Well, there, there's three options generally when, when um, there's a violation of the Clean Water Act. Mm -hmm. One is to proceed administratively, right. which is usually a decision that's made by EPA or the Corps of Engineers with it, without consulting with the Department of Justice. Okay. Uh, those administrative actions might be challenged down the road and then we get involved, uh, but then those end up being defensive cases. Right. Uh, uh, so we, you know, until there's litigation, uh, we don't get involved in that. Uh, the two other options are civil prosecution and criminal prosecution. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they tend to be on different tracks during the investigative stage of, of a proceeding, uh, especially at EPA, because they have a separate criminal division uh, that looks at violations from a criminal perspective and makes a decision whether to proceed criminally or not. Uh, and then they have their civil side uh, that looks at a particular uh, alleged violation and decides whether, whether it should proceed civilly. Um, we, we, civil tends to defer to criminal. So if there's a criminal investigation uh, and a possibility of criminal enforcement, then generally that's going to go first uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, uh, but if there is no criminal prosecution, uh, then uh, we can decide whether to proceed civilly. And there are cases when, when we have parallel proceedings uh, for example, there might be a, a criminal investigation, a, a case might be before a grand jury. Conceivably, we're facing statute of limitations issues on the civil side. Mm -hmm. If we don't bring a complaint, uh, then we're going to lose that opportunity. And if the uh, alleged violator is not willing to enter into a tolling agreement, uh, then we have no choice but to bring that civil case. But if we know that there is a criminal prosecution underway, we will then ask that the court stay the civil side. There, there are a number of complications uh, that we've experienced when you try to do both criminal and civil at the same time, involving uh, pleading the Fifth Amendment, uh, uh, using civil discovery right. on, the, on the defense side to try to obtain evidence about the criminal prosecution and things like that that as a matter of policy, we have decided that uh, criminal should take, take precedence over, over civil. But it does create some, some odd situations. For, for a civil case to proceed uh, to, to actually being filed in district court, um, there has to be a referral from EPA or the Corps of Engineers. That's how we get our cases. You asked how we prioritize them uh, to a large extent. It's the Corps of Engineers and EPA that prioritize, decide which ones to pursue administratively. And the ones they think should go civilly, they refer to us. So we're dealing with a, a limited deck of cards to begin with. Right. There's not a whole lot to prioritize because you know, the, the number of referrals is, is probably in the range of 5 to 15 a year. Oh, okay. Uh, so, so they're yeah. almost self-selected. The yeah. criminal side is, is very different because those cases don't have to originate with EPA or the Corps of Engineers. They can originate from anywhere. They can be a, a private tipster who goes to the FBI and says, I think someone is violating Section 404 of the Clean Water Act. And, and uh, a U.S. Attorney's Office or the FBI or the criminal side of EPA, whatever, can run with that case, uh, and uh, you know, eventually, a U.S. Attorney's Office or 
or our environmental crime section will be involved, and they'll decide whether to, to bring an indictment. Uh, but the source of, of the prosecution can be anything. Wow. So, uh, now, number wise, you mentioned five to 15 referrals in the civil area per year. Um, on the criminal side, what would a normal year be for uh, the number of criminal cases moving forward in wetlands, a 404 program? It, it averages about two a year. Okay, so it's a fairly small it, number of criminal proceedings. That's true. They, yeah. they tend to be very high profile. Right. <laughs> and the, the main reason for that is that uh, uh, almost all of our 404 prosecutions in, involve people's private property. 75% right. of all wetlands are on private property. Right. So uh, when we bring a, a, an enforcement action, uh, we're, we're telling people that they can't do something that they want to do on their private property. So uh, that brings into, uh, into play the, the whole private property rights uh, movement and, uh, you know, very often some some particular uh, defendants will will get support from say the Pacific Legal Foundation or other uh, interest groups that uh, are you know, who see it as their objective to protect people's private property rights. Uh, so so many of those cases become high profile. Okay. Uh, and and then some people just on their own, uh, you know, whether they're represented by the Pacific Legal Foundation or not, uh, just feel that the federal government has no role in telling them what they can do on their private property. So uh, they tend not to want to settle their cases and uh, and uh, see them through to the end.